Welcome to the Rancho Mirage Public Library. My name is Susan Cook, and I am the principal librarian. How many of you have been to one of Kurt's other lectures here at the library? Okay, so we have some new folks. How many of you here were here for the hummingbird lecture that we had? And are you ready to hear hummingbirds again? Yes, okay. We might do that. I have to say, I w when Kurt said he had a lecture on insects, I thought, oh, I want to know more about insects, and I thought it would sound interesting. So I thought, we will try. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to the Ranch Mirage Public Library this afternoon. We appreciate our fine audience and how smart you are and how appreciative you are. And uh, if you could just take a moment and turn off your cell phone, if you've got your cell phone with you today. Thank you. Um, as always, I want to thank the Ranch Mirage Public Library Foundation because, as they know, they are the entity that helps us produce all our programs here at the library. Um, please welcome back to the desert um, Professor of Natural Resources at the College of the Desert, Kurt Lerschner, um, who is well known throughout the desert for leading um, hundreds of, of field trips locally and nationally, as well as teaching on a variety of um, natural science topics. And today he is going to help us relate a little bit better and understand our desert insects. So with that, please welcome Kurt Lerschner. So uh, this is not the hummingbird lecture, <laughs> but maybe we'll bring that one back. Uh, this, today I'm talking about um, insects and other bugs. Ar that's why it's called insects and other arthropods, so we can throw in a few spiders and things like that just for fun, which are not technically insects. Um, I wanted to mention our wildflower festival coming up a week from, it's Saturday, March 5th, so what is that, two weeks from now? Um, but I hope maybe to see some of you there. Uh, bugs and wildflowers kind of go together. And I'll be there, uh, and I hope that you can too. It's a one-day event, but we do it every year, and it's a fundraiser for the Friends of the Desert Mountains. There's also some information in the back. I can talk to you afterwards if you like, uh, if you want to grab a flyer about upcoming outings and uh, information on how to contact me. If you have follow-up questions, uh, make sure you grab one of the flyers that has my contact information on it. It's the one that's printed on both sides. And if any of you want to be on the mailing list, the email list for the Desert Cities Bird Club, there's also a little slip of paper there I just need your name and your email address, and that's all you need to do, and I'll add you to the list if you like. And then you'll hear about um, upcoming um, events, talks like this one, uh, birding activities, um, other outings, etc. We'll send you our newsletter three times a year. But today I'm here to talk about insects. I'm going to start you out with a non-insect. But it is an arthropod. This is a spider, a black widow spider. And uh, we do have plenty of these around the desert. Maybe you've noticed. They like slightly damp areas. So you'll often find them hiding under cupboards and dark corners, or maybe in your water meter box when you go to open it up, places like that. The male is that tiny little guy in the lower right. You see the male there? Uh, now, he's got to be really careful because, as you know, after mating, uh, the female will have him for lunch, um, hence the name Black Widow Spider. Sometimes he gets away, though, um, and sometimes he just loses a few limbs in the process. But even a male black widow with three limbs can still return and mate a second time with the female. So that's a pretty common sighting. But we rarely notice the male because first of all he's not big and he's not black and he looks like a lot of other little spiders that you probably just passed off as some little brown spider. 
The female, though, has the red hourglass, and it's one of only a few spiders in the world that are actually um, dangerous, venomous, um, poisonous to humans. Technically, uh, they're poisonous and venomous. Poisonous refers to if you ingest a chemical that causes some kind of harmful reaction, that's poison, poisonous. Venomous technically means the poison is injected through fangs or through a stinger. So in this case, since the black widow would be biting you with her fangs, she is venomous, uh, but she's also referred to as poisonous either way. But all the other spiders in the valley um, are ones you pretty much don't have to worry about, with the exception of maybe the next two I'm going to show you. Um, there is a new widow in town, if you didn't know about it. Have you heard about the brown widow? Uh, well, she arrived in our area just a few years ago, 2003. Uh, it arrived in California around 2000, probably in a, a crate or a shipment. And I believe Torrance over there in the South Bay area was the arrival point for the Brown Widow. And from there it spread all over Southern California. So now they're fairly common here in the desert. So something new to watch for, the Brown Widow. Um, they are also venomous, poisonous. However, um, it's not as toxic as the black widow, and they're not as aggressive as the black widow. So there's very little chance that um, you would be bitten by one of these brown widows. But um, I frequently find them um, around old trash cans, under trash can lids, or maybe under patio furniture, that, or, or barbecue you haven't touched in your backyard for a while. Um, they like the drier areas compared to the black widow. So they also have the red hourglass on the bottom side of the abdomen, just like the black widow. But since they're not black, it doesn't stand out as much. So that's the brown widow. Now, maybe you've heard about this brown recluse. So let me clear that up a little bit. We don't have brown recluse spiders here. Let me put that myth to bed. There's no brown recluse. We do have another recluse here, though, called the desert recluse. So if you look at the map on the right, you can see the, the purple range is the range of the desert recluse spider. Um, it might be as dangerous as the brown recluse. Um, others say it's not. So the one that you hear about so much, though, is the brown recluse, and that occurs in the Midwest area over near um, St. Louis and some of those states over there in the red. So we do have the desert recluse here. It's a brown spider. Most spiders are brown and small. So people tend to see any old brown spider and then assume, oh, it must be a brown recluse um, because it's brown and it's a spider. Well. Again, most spiders are brown, uh, so that doesn't really um, mean it's a recluse spider of any kind. So you won't see the brown recluse here. You might see the desert recluse, but even that one is very, very hard to ever see. So not something you really have to worry about. If you do see a spider, though, and you're curious what it is, uh, you could always send me a photo. So if you get my email address back there, um, Take a photo with your, with your phone or whatever you've got and, and just uh, send it to me and then I can let you know that it's not a, a brown recluse or a desert recluse. I've yet to have somebody send me a picture of a real recluse spider. So that's it for the spiders that might potentially uh, be harmful to you were you to handle them improperly and usually people don't. All the rest of the spiders, totally harmless, just fun to look at. These ones you may know as daddy long legs. True daddy long legs like this one are not a true spider. They're in a totally different order from spiders. They're spider-like and they are arachnids and they do have eight legs, but that's where the similarities end. Um, they have one body segment only, as you can see. They don't have a head and a separate cephalothorax like a true spider would. So it's just one single body segment with eight legs. There's no fangs. There's no venom. There's no silk. 
None of those things associated with true spiders and absolutely no harm to you. There's uh, some rumors going on out there that even, even though they don't have fangs, they have some incredibly toxic venom. Well, it's just not true. They don't have either of those things. Now, this is a true spider that you probably see in your house. This is called a cellar spider. And you'll notice it does have two body segments. There is a small head there and then a larger cephalothorax. So there's two body segments. Um, it's a true spider, but these ones are often mistaken for the previous one, the daddy long legs. This is not technically a daddy long legs, um, but everybody's got them in their homes or in the eaves of your house. They're all over the place, and they're actually called um, cellar spiders. Totally harmless. Another harmless type spider is the desert tarantula. Now, these are quite large. The females live in burrows, such as the one on the right. So they, the female spends almost her entire life underground in that burrow, which may go down about a foot or so. And she can live 20 to 30 years in that burrow. She'll come out at night and travel a short distance around the burrow, maybe just to feed, and then she retreats right back into the burrow. So she really never even leaves the burrow area her whole life. The male, however, is the one that you'll see cruising around uh, and getting into all kinds of trouble. His lifespan is very short. Uh, well, I mean, he's lucky to live a year, you know, two maybe, because of his nomadic nature. He's wandering around. He's exposing himself to all kinds of predators and people and cars and getting run over. Um, it's very hazardous for the males. So when you see a tarantula walking around, and I hope you get the chance to, uh, you're going to be seeing a male almost every single time. And the best time to see tarantulas here in the desert is October and November. So that's tarantula time around here. So if you're just here part of the year, make sure you come back in time to see the tarantulas in October and November. Uh, some of the best places to come across them are Joshua Tree National Park or the Indian Canyons in Palm Springs by taking a hike on some of the trails in October and November. Uh, those are two good areas to run into tarantulas. Oops. Here's uh, an interesting critter. Maybe you've seen a lot of misinformation going around the valley about this one. It's not a vinegar rune. So please stop calling them vinegar runes. <laughs> I don't know who started that rumor, but um, they're really nothing like vinegar runes. A vinegar rune is that critter on the right. Lower right. Kind of looks like a scorpion, dark in color, but instead of having a stinger for a tail, it has a whip for a tail with no stinger. So that is a vinegar rune. They occur down in Mexico. They rarely cross the border uh, into southern Arizona and maybe extreme southern California, right at the border area, right around uh, maybe Mexicali. But there are no records that I know of of vinegar runes in the Coachella Valley region. There's a lot of rumors that there's vinegar runes here, but I've yet to see proof. So I challenge any of you to either bring me a specimen or show me a photo of a real vinegar rune taken here in the valley. I, I hope somebody will, but so far nobody's taken me up on that. Uh, but we do have in abundance these guys, which are not vinegar runes, but they've got a lot of other names like camel spider, sun spider, wind scorpion. I kind of prefer that one because they're actually more closely related to scorpions than they are to spiders. Um, but they don't have a stinger, you may notice. And even though they look kind of scary, um, they're essentially harmless to you. I mean, if you were to pick one up and maybe harass it, yes, it might nip you with its um, mouth parts, and that might hurt a little bit. But otherwise, they're, they're non-aggressive to you. They want nothing to do with you, and they're just going to run the other way if you see them. In fact, they're called wind scorpions because they run like the wind. They're super fast. 
And when you turn on the lights in your kitchen one night, you might see one of these just zoom across the floor. Has that ever happened to somebody? They're good to have around, though, because they eat black widow spiders. They eat crickets. They eat cockroaches. So they're helping you out. They're on pest patrol in your house, <laughs> cruising around at night, trying to rid your home of these other pesty things. And they can grow to about um, a couple of inches long, so they get fairly big. But they're, they're pretty neat critters. Um, they're actually called solifugids, solifugids. Some people like calling them solpugids, but technically the only family or the Solpugid family of these guys only occurs in Africa, not here. So technically, we don't have Solpugids here. They're called Solifugids. Now, how about a true scorpion? We've got a, a lot of scorpions here in the valley, especially in the sandy areas. Uh, the, you know, the closer you might live to desert hot springs or Thousand Palms, the more scorpions you're going to have out there. They like the really sandy areas. There's two main species that you might see around here. I mean, there's probably about a dozen species that occur in the valley, but there's two that you're most likely to see. This one might be the most common. It's called the desert hairy scorpion. They're a little thicker and wider bodied than the other common one, which is called a sand scorpion. The sand scorpion is like a thinner, trimmer version of this one. And the desert hairy scorpions like to eat the sand scorpions. They also will eat desert hairy scorpions, smaller ones. So there's no protection by being the same species either. It turns out that all scorpions in the world fluoresce under ultraviolet light. They glow. And no one knows exactly why, but obviously there's a chemical inside scorpions that does fluoresce when you expose it to ultraviolet light. And that's what I did here. I shined a black light onto this scorpion. That little step there, that's my room at the Desert Study Center. So as I was packing up to leave after a weekend of fun at the Desert Study Center out in the Mojave Desert, I picked up my bag and this giant um, scorpion was underneath it. And so I, I took out my UV light, which I always have handy, and lit him up, and then we all took pictures of him, and then we let him go. Um, but this is the same one that you'll see right here um, in Rancho Mirage, the, the, the Desert Hairy. And yes, they could sting you, but the sting would be no more um, dangerous than a bee sting, if that. So most people would have very little reaction or no reaction, and they're not likely to sting you. They're not aggressive, like almost all of these insects and arthropods I'm showing you, uh, they're not aggressive. Unless you really, really harass them, they're going to leave you alone. So there's no need to panic when you see any of these things. Um, so anyway, back to the scorpions glowing. It's a fluorescence, not a phosphorescence. So fluorescent is like fluorescent lights. You turn on the switch, you energize it, and the lights glow. And as soon as you turn off the switch, the lights stop glowing. Contrast that with, let's say, a glow-in-the-dark frisbee. You put it under a light, light it up for a while, then you turn off the lights, and the frisbee will continue to glow for some time until it finally wears off. That's phosphorescence. So since these guys only glow when they are energized by the UV light, it's fluorescence. And as soon as you remove the UV light, they stop glowing. Now, why might they glow? It could just be a random thing. Uh, maybe it has no meaning at all. It just so happens scorpions have a chemical in them that fluoresces, which is kind of interesting to us. Or maybe there is some significance to it. Maybe other scorpions can see them under the moonlight better, or maybe their prey victims, like moths, are somehow attracted to this glow under certain conditions, and that brings the food closer to the scorpion for feeding. Um, just don't know exactly. Scorpions live in, underground in spiral underground burrows that can go down a few feet. And they're always a spiral. Um, and that way they can adjust their position anywhere on the spiral depending on the temperature. So if it gets too cold, they can come up towards the surface. If it gets too hot, they can go down to a lower room in the spiral. 
And the spiral also helps trap uh, cold air and, and condense water, so it, it keeps it cool. So there's a lot of neat things about scorpions. I could do a whole talk on scorpions. Maybe next time. Here's a fun little insect. Now, this is our first insect of the group. It's called an antlion. Maybe you've heard of the term doodle bug. That little guy on the right is the doodle bug. That is the larva of the antlion. So when antlions are young, they look like that little guy on the right, and they live in the ground. And when they turn into an adult, they look like this thing on the left, which has wings and kind of looks like a damselfly. And they come to your porch light at night. They're totally harmless. Um, so just enjoy seeing them when they come to your porch light any day now. The young are a lot of fun, and they live in these underground burrows or pit traps that they construct themselves. They make a new one every day. And you can see at the base of the pit trap is the antlion larvae with his jaws wide open. And as soon as an unsuspecting ant tumbles into the trap, it falls into the jaws of the antlion, and that's how he feeds. So uh, next time you're out with me, we'll find some ants, and we'll throw them into the little pits, and we'll watch the antlions feed. It's just nature, you know, and they got to eat too. Um, and um, these young antlions can live this way for a couple of years or more before they fatten up and go through their metamorphosis and turn into adults. But in your own backyards, you probably have these little circular pits. Maybe you've noticed them around where you're walking and wondered what makes them. Well, now you know. There's an antlion larvae waiting for you to feed it. This is one of the first insects to come out in spring or I should say in winter because our spring comes really early here in the desert, like now. <laughs> so the green lacewings are already starting to come out. And these are really great to have in your yard. They're what's what we call a beneficial insect because they eat aphids. So if you don't like aphids and you want a natural way to get rid of aphids, then encourage the green lacewings to hang out in your yard. And you can do that by not spraying pesticides around because it also kills the friendly insects too. Totally harmless. You'll see them at your porch light and they eat loads of aphids. In fact, their nickname is aphid lion. Not ant lion, aphid lion. Honeybees. Now, uh, European honeybees are very common, but did you know that they are not native to the United States? They're a foreign species. They were brought in around the time of the pilgrims in the 1600s from the old world. Now, there's a couple reasons uh, we brought honeybees over to the new world. One is to give us honey, which we all like having, and another important um, resource they provide is crop pollination for crops. You know, farmers actually rent out hives of honeybees during certain times of the year to pollinate their crops. So they're important to have around, but they are imports. They're not native. And I just remind people that because we do have a lot of native bees here too. And our native bees, which tend to be solitary and non-aggressive, they're not colonial like the honeybees, uh, tend to get crowded out or pushed out by these European honeybees. Anyway, back to the honeybee. Uh, there's another honeybee in town, and that's the Africanized honeybee that you've heard about, or the so-called killer bee. Now, killer bees, uh, or Africanized honeybees, are a subspecies of honeybee. So both of these are the same species, Apis mellifera. There's no difference there. In fact, in the field, you cannot tell a regular European honeybee, which is less aggressive, from an Africanized honeybee, which is more aggressive. You can't tell them apart in the field. So don't let your neighbor or your friend or some so-called expert tell you that they can distinguish between them in the field. They can't. You've got to take them back to the lab, look at them probably under a dissecting microscope, to, and take some very calculated measurements in order to tell the difference because um, there is no difference in the field. 
So they look the same. Um, the Africanized honeybees can only sting you one time, just like a regular honeybee, so there's no difference there. It's just that the Africanized honeybees tend to be more aggressive and then maybe they're more likely to sting you than a European honeybee. And since they normally occur in big numbers, if you're stung multiple times, obviously that can be a problem. But no need to panic. Uh, people have been living with these Africanized honeybees for decades now, and they're doing just fine. So a little bit of common sense goes a long way. Um, we do have Africanized honeybees here in the valley now. They're here to stay. It's not something that we can really get rid of. We just have to learn to live with them, and we can. And the good news is most of the Africanized honeybees, uh, if not all of them, that are here in the valley are hybrids. They've mixed with the, with the uh, calmer European honeybees, and so the ones we have are kind of in between. Maybe slightly more aggressive than a European, but not as aggressive as a pure hive of Africanized honeybees might be. The carpenter bees are coming out, uh, and soon there'll be lots of them out as it's warming up now. And mostly you see the females, which are black. The females outnumber the males at least, I'd say, 50 to 1, maybe even more. This is a male on the right. So now that you know that the black ones are the females, see if you can spot a male one of these days. That'll be a nice change for you. Um, but most bees in general that you see are all females. So all of these um, bees and wasps and ants, they're almost all female societies. So almost all of them that you see flying around um, are the females. And by the way, only the females can sting. And that's true of any ant, bee, or wasp. But because they have an all-female society, that means pretty much everybody can sting you but only the females can sting. So if you see a male bee or wasp or ant, which is kind of a rare sighting, know that the male cannot sting you. There's no stinger there. Because a stinger is nothing more than a modified ovipositor. And since the females are the ones with the ovipositors to lay the eggs, they're the only ones that can develop stingers. But anyway, these carpenter bees are even though the female could sting you, uh, you're not likely to be stung by them. They're, they're solitary. They're non-aggressive. Um, I've never known anybody to be stung by one, but technically it's possible. Um, they're mostly they're interested in finding rotting wood. That's why you see them buzzing around the eaves of your house looking for a soft spot or maybe buzzing around an old fence post or an agave stalk, somewhere where they can burrow in and create a hole and lay, some lay an egg or two in that hole. That's what they're looking for. So they're called carpenter bees because they like to chew out rotting wood and modify and make those holes. Now I could do another whole talk just on native bees, but here's an example of one of the so-called native bees. The carpenter bee is native too, by the way, and this one is as well. This is called the leaf cutter bee. And this is the bee that cuts out little half circles out of the leaves in your garden. So if you've ever noticed certain plants in your garden missing little circular shapes in the leaves that have been chewed out, that's the leaf cutter bee. Uh, there's certain leaves that they really prefer over, over other ones, even rose, rose leaves I think they will use. And so what the female is doing is she's biting those, cutting out those leaves and she's going to take that leaf chunk and she's going to find a hole like this one in this bee house. And she's going to line the inside of this cylinder with those leaves. And then she's going to lay an egg inside there. And she's going to provision that egg with some bee bread, which is a mixture of pollen and honey. And that's going to be the food that her young is going to eat when it's developing inside this hole. And then she'll seal off that chamber. She'll lay another egg, put more bee bread on there, um, seal it off. She'll fill this whole tube up with different cells, maybe four or five, six of them, each with its own egg and its own provision. And this whole tube then is lined with the leaves from your garden. 
So that's the leaf cutter bee. There's another bee called the wool carter bee, which does a similar thing, but it lines its tube with woolly-like substance that it gathers from flowers. So, you know, this is a nice, a nice mother bee just trying to make a nice soft area for her young to develop in. Now, bee houses. This is a bee house. Remember, only the non-native honeybees are colonial and nest in hives and, and occur in large numbers all in one place. All the rest of our native bees are solitary. And they want nothing to do with other bees, even the ones of their own kind. So they just hang out by themselves. But what a lot of these solitary native bees are looking for is a hole, a place to put their eggs in, like I just described. So you can really help them out by putting up a bee house of your own. So if you want native bees to occur in your garden to help pollinate your native plants, then you, you definitely want to add a few bee houses there to help them out. And they'll appreciate it. And they'll use them. And you can tell that they're used up because they'll fill the whole tube up. And at the very end, they'll seal it over with a mixture of pebbles and, and saliva and cement. And so you can tell that it's being used. Now, when the young hatch, they have to crawl out of the tube. So you may wonder, how does the guy who hatches in the back get through all the other cells to get out of the tube? That's an interesting question. And I guess they just have it all figured out. They all tend to hatch about the same time, even though this leg was laid just a little bit before the others. But they all tend to hatch at the same time, and there's sort of a simultaneous trek to the exit hole on their way out. But sometimes, yeah, they might have to climb over their brothers and sisters to get out of the tube. Um, now these bee houses are easy to make and I can help you with that if you email me. Um, but if you ever wanna make your own, just make sure you don't use treated wood. It's gotta be non-treated wood. And get yourself a scrap of like a four by six, works really great, so that you can drill in the long end of the four by six. You don't wanna drill all the way through the other side, you wanna stop short and vary the depth of the holes. Some of them can be five inches, some of them can be four inches, some of them can be three. If you have varied um, depths, you'll have more males or more females being produced. And so you'll have a nice mix of both male and female bees that are produced. The depth of the hole actually determines or helps determine the sex of the young. Um, so you wanna mix it up a bit. And in terms of the diameter of the hole, I've found through trial and error that one quarter inch is a very popular hole here in the Coachella Valley. A quarter inch drill bit. So start with that and then mix it up. Put a few bigger ones, put a couple smaller ones, but the majority of them can be a quarter inch. And just drill away. You know, start drilling into scrap wood, start drilling into posts, start drilling into fence posts. Wherever you can put your drill, just start making holes. And these bees will fill them up. It's a lot of fun to see. Here's a really cool insect you might see this spring. It's called a tarantula hawk wasp. They're huge, or they can be. Now, if you see a really huge one of these, and then you see a really small version of one, the small version is not a baby of the larger one. Okay, there's no baby wasps that you're going to see. Um, once wasps emerge and have their wings, they are adults, and that's as big as they're going to get. So if you see a tarantula hawk wasp in two different sizes, what you're seeing is two different species. Some species happen to be larger, some are smaller. But I bet you've seen these guys flying around. They're kind of an iridescent blackish blue with these orange wings, kind of a scary looking wasp. And even though technically they could sting you, they're not likely to. They're non-aggressive. So just leave them alone, and they'll leave you alone. What they're looking for is tarantulas. And when the female finds a tarantula, she will sting it and paralyze it. She will not kill it. She will paralyze it. And then she will drag that paralyzed victim back to a hole that she has dug in the ground nearby. And she will stuff that tarantula into the hole. Then she will lay a single egg, usually it's one egg, on that lifeless uh, but still alive uh, tarantula. And when that egg hatches, then it has fresh meat to eat. 
And so the, the larva will develop inside the hole. It's got all the food that it needs. Eventually, it completes its metamorphosis and flies out of the hole to start the process all over again. So it's, it's, it's really um, an interesting thing to see sometime. And, and one time, I did get lucky and, and got to see the whole show right in front of me. And I was told by some experts that they only will paralyze tarantulas. That's the only food they'll eat. And that got me thinking, well, what do they eat when there's no tarantulas walking around? Because there's, there's a big part of the year where there's no tarantulas around. Do they starve? Do they take other victims of other species? According to the books, no. And then what did I see one day? I saw one sting and paralyze a large grasshopper. And it did the same thing. It dragged it back to a hole. I watched it dig the hole. I watched it drag it into the hole and do the whole thing. So I know at least for that one instance, they'll take something else besides tarantulas, if tarantulas are not available. Now, the only person I've ever known to be stung by a tarantula hawk wasp, have any of you been stung by one of these? I don't see any hands. Um, I, I do know one person, he's a friend of mine, who was stung by one, but it really wasn't the wasp's fault. He was riding his motorcycle, and one of them flew into his mouth. So you can't blame that on the, on the wasp, can you? It was just a, a matter of poor, bad timing on both their parts. Um, he was going about 45 or so. Luckily, he wasn't going super fast, or the ending might not have been so good. But he did crash. He did go to the hospital. He was, he was in bad shape, and his throat was all swollen because it did sting him in the throat. Um, but he's okay. He's perfectly okay. You'd never know this happened. But that's the only um, time I know. And again, it wasn't the wasp's fault. There's a, a fun group of wasps around town called uh, Thread Wasted Wasps. Thread Wasted Wasps. Try saying that really fast. And one of those uh, Thread Wasted Wasps is the mud dauber, and it makes this little organ pipe mud formation that you see on the right. And so you'll often see wasps at the edge of your swimming pool or at the edge of a pond, they're gathering water and they're going to mix it with mud, you know, to create a plaster. And then they're going to go fly back somewhere, maybe under the eave of your house or in some other corner. And they're going to start to, to um, shape that mud into, in this case, um, an organ pipe formation. They'll, these are hollow inside. There's little side holes. And they stuff these chambers full of paralyzed little spiders. And they lay an egg or two in the chamber, and, the, and that's what the uh, young wasps are going to feed on. So it's kind of like the tarantula hawk story, except in this case, um, it's a whole chamber full of tiny little spiders, not tarantulas, but they're all paralyzed. So that's the mud dauber. And here's one called the potter wasp. So you might see this one come into your swimming pool too, but this one's going to go back, <clears throat> and it's going to, it's obviously taken a class in ceramics because. <laughs> It makes this cute little uh, oya, you know, this little pot, and that's what it's going to stick its paralyzed spiders in and lay an egg or two inside the oya. And then flies away, and then the young are on their own. So sometimes you'll find these cute little teeny pots kind of stuck, you know, on a lawn furniture or on the eaves of your house or on the corner of your window. Um, and now you know who did it. That's the potter wasp. Ants. The ants are coming out. Um, they like the heat. And uh, we have a lot of ants here in the valley. There's a lot of ants worldwide. They're all in the same family. That's um, unlike other insects, ants are all in one family, Formicidae. And so all ants produce formic acid. That's why they're in the family Formicidae. And so when, <clears throat> when an ant stings you, and it's the females that sting you, um, they're injecting form, uh, a formic acid into your bloodstream, and that's what you feel as that, that stinging sensation. It's that acid kind of hitting the bloodstream there, formic acid. Now, ants can bite, and ants can sting, so they can kind of get you at both ends um, if they want to. But when you feel the pain of an ant, you're usually feeling the sting, not so much the bite. And unlike a, a honeybee, of course, they, couldn't, they can sting you multiple times if they want to. 
We have a lot of harvester ants here in the desert. These are the common ants that you might see out in the desert as you're hiking around, um, gathering bits and pieces of leaf litter and vegetation or seeds. That's why they're called harvester ants. And they take this, these seeds and other um, plant vegetation back to their burrows and they will consume it later inside the burrow. But they're very busy ants just going back and forth from their central burrow to gather all the seeds they can in a given area. We've got harvester ants that are all red. We've got harvester ants that are all black. We've got harvester ants that are red and black. So there's many different species. But harvester ant is a good general term that refers to a lot of these ants that you see out in the desert. Not so much the ones you see in your kitchen. That's something different. Those are probably Argentine ants or something imported. But they're, they're pretty much harmless to you. I mean, like, yeah, technically they can sting you, but if you leave them alone, they'll, they'll leave you alone. And these aren't likely to come into your house either. Now, here's uh, an ant you don't want to pick up. And it's not even really an ant. It's a wasp. It's a female wasp. I'm talking about the one on the lower left. But people refer to them as a velvet ant because they're cute and cuddly. But don't be fooled. Um, <clears throat> on the Schmidt pain, pain Index of Insect Stings, you heard of that? Look it up online. It's a lot of fun. Um, this guy named Schmidt came up with, I don't know how he did it, maybe he tested them all out on himself, but he came up with the most painful insect stings in the world and created his own index of pain. So it's called the Schmidt Pain Index of Insect Stings. This guy is on that top 10 list, so, uh, and it's a gal, by the way, a female, so... Um, she is, packs a wallop. I've never experienced it. I don't want to ever know how painful it is, but the nicknames of this velvet ant <clears throat> tell you something. One nickname is horse crippler. Another nickname is cow killer. Um, so they really do um, cause a lot of pain in horses and cows when they step on these females accidentally. So anyway, the female is a wingless wasp. She's not really an ant. She's a wasp that has no wings, so she's confined to the ground and just sniffs around like a bloodhound all day long on the ground, looking for larvae of other insects to prey upon. The male has wings, and he also is flying around looking for the females throughout the day. But remember, the male does not sting. Totally harmless. These come in a variety of colors. We have a red one, there's an orange one, there's a yellowish one, and my favorite is the all-white one. It looks like a fuzzy um, a creosote bush seed, uh, and it happens to occur underneath the creosote bushes. So it looks like one of the creosote bush seeds has just gotten up and started walking around because it's white and fuzzy. Now, there's a lot of um, interesting connections between insects and plants. And I never really took classes in botany when I was in college. I kind of wish I, I had, but I just never did. It didn't particularly interest me at the time. I was a zoology major. Um, but the more that I've studied <clears throat> insects, the more I've almost been forced to learn about plants because there's so many connections between insects and plants. So later in life, I've been really trying to learn a lot more about plants. And this is one of those interesting connections between the two worlds. They're called galls, G-A-L-L. -L. These are some common ones maybe you've seen before on oak trees. Some people call these oak apples because they're red when they first form. Um, but they're actually caused by a small insect, a tiny little wasp. And this wasp is so tiny that it could fly through the eye of a needle. So we're not talking about a wasp that you notice or would ever see. It's a tiny little thing. And the female of this wasp finds the host plant, which in this case happens to be an oak tree. She lays an egg on the stem of that host plant. She injects a chemical along with it. And that chemical acts as a hormone that triggers the growth of this gall. 
So the gall is actually produced by the host plant. It's part of the plant. It's almost like a cancerous growth in a way. Uh, but it's produced only because of the stimulation of the insect, only because of that chemical stimulation. And of course, the reasoning for this is that the gall is going to form around the egg that she's just laid and provide the egg, or in this case, four eggs, a safe place to develop. So you see those four little eggs in there. Each one of those, uh, if conditions are right, will develop into a, an adult little wasp, and they'll drill a little hole out the side and exit from the gall. So it turns out there's all kinds of galls, different sizes, different shapes on different host plants. Um, I've got a whole collection of them going, and I'm, I'm always fascinated to, to learn more about these galls. Um, but many of them are caused by tiny little wasps, like this one. The creosote bush, and this is something you can see even uh, this afternoon after the talk. Find yourself a creosote bush. Maybe there's one growing near where you live. And look closely, and you'll probably see some old galls from last season. They're brownish. They're easy to spot. And if you look really closely, especially in a few weeks from now, you'll start to see the bright green galls, the new ones from this year. They blend right in, though, because they look just like the color of the leaves of the creosote. These galls are actually caused to form by a small fly. It's called a midge. So it's a relative of the mosquito. But a teeny tiny little fly uh, seeks out the creosote bush and creates or causes the creosote to create this gall. One of the first insects to come out um, in spring or when it gets warm is the crane fly. You probably have seen these buzzing around your light fixtures around your porch light. They're very common, and they're totally harmless. This is um, an adult. They look like a giant mosquito, don't they? You know, and a lot of people might think, oh, wow, that's some big mosquito looking to take a blood meal. Well, it turns out they don't feed at all. They don't feed. They're only interested in finding a mate, and if they're females, laying eggs, and that's it. So they're kind of like mayflies. They have no interest in feeding. They have no way to bite you. Totally harmless. Crane fly. Here's another fly you might see buzzing around your house. Um, maybe you're in your living room and you hear this buzzing racket behind the curtain or something, and you might think a bumblebee or something has gotten inside your house. Probably it's a robber fly. They make the same kind of sort of humming and buzzing noise that a bee might make. And these guys are actually good to have around your house because they're also on pest patrol. They love to eat house flies, those pesky house flies that land on you and you, you feel like you need to get a fly swatter for. These guys just tackle those house flies in midair and then devour them. So again, they're buzzing around your house, helping you to rid your home of house flies. So think about that before you try swatting them. That's a robber fly. I actually heard a cicada yesterday, which was kind of weird. You know, normally they don't start buzzing until late summer or when we get those humid days of September. Um, but one of them was just buzzing out of the blue yesterday. Now, the cicadas that we have here in the west are not like the kind they have back east. Those are called periodic cicadas, and some of them stay underground for as, as many as 17 years. So they stay underground 17 years as a young cicada, just munching on roots. And then after 17 years, they all emerge at once. And then you got to wait another 17 years for the next crop to kind of come out. So that's what's called a periodic cicada. Now, maybe some of you grew up or live in areas where you have periodic cicadas, and you remember those years, you know, when they come out. Here in the West, it's not like that. Our cicadas are annual cicadas. So there's always a few of them coming out every year. We don't get those like boom or bust kind of situations with cicadas. So you can always count on a few of them being around. But we don't have as many as places like Texas where they can be deafening. It is one of the loudest sounds in nature is the hum of a cicada. <coughs> so what you see here, this is the adult on the left. And the way that they make their sound is by vibrating at a very, very fast rate their body. Their main body is composed of these kind of ribs, and they rub these ribs back and forth together, and that's what creates this buzzing sound that you hear. Um, 
it is a mating call. You could call it that because, yeah, that's, that's the time of year that they're doing it. Um, they emerge out of the ground. So they'll crawl out of your lawn or out of the ground. They'll hook into something they can grab onto. They love stucco houses. So you'll find their little exoskeletons attached to the side of your, your house if it's kind of a stucco-y material with the little bumps. They hook into that, and then they crawl out of their skin, just like you see the one doing on the left. And that's the adult emerging. And once the adult emerges, it looks like the one on the left. They live for maybe a couple of weeks. They mate, they lay eggs, and that's the end of the story. So with a lot of these insects, by the time you see them, by the time you notice them, they're adults, and they're already at the end of their life. So you're just seeing sort of the final act when you see insects and things flying around. Most of these insects are only going to live a few days, maybe a couple weeks as adults. Most of them spent their whole life, or most of their life as young, kind of hidden in the ground. Now, if you see this white uh, goopy stuff growing on your favorite cactus, it's actually caused by an insect. It's called a cochineal scale. And so inside that white stuff is a tiny little insect, like a little brownish bump. And that's the insect, and it's busy sucking the juice out of its favorite cactus. And when you squish one of these little insects, just like on the left here, they bleed kind of a bright reddish magenta color, which is a very useful and a natural dye. And it's been used for, for years uh, for all kinds of things like lipstick to get all those different shades of red, um, clothing to dye our clothing. You remember the red coats in the Revolutionary War? Those coats were dyed with cochineal scale um, hemolymph. Um, some of those artificial, those drinks that we drink, like um, sodas and um, that are red in color, or those cherries that are red that aren't supposed to be red, those are dyed with cochineal scale. Um, so we're eating this stuff and consuming it and wearing it um, all the time, and we don't even realize it. Um, it's approved by the FDA. It's, it's a natural dye. It's harmless to you, and it's very useful around the world. And when the um, first explorers kind of came to the new world and were so um, enamored with finding gold, you know, and bringing it back to the old world, they also found the cochineal scale. So besides gold, which is always number one on everybody's list, um, this was the second most important thing that was found in the New World that was brought back to the Old World. And so now if you go to Europe and Asia and Africa, you'll see cochineal scale and the cactus it grows on all over the place. People actually grow it and cultivate it for the useful dye. And now if you want to get this off of your cactus, try to avoid using chemicals. That's always a good thing. But you can just take a strong hose and hose it off, um, and you'll be able to control most of it. If you allow it to completely cover the cactus pad, though, it can kill that pad and eventually kill all of your cactus if you let it take over. So if you just control it every now and then, that's usually enough to just keep it down, and your cactus will be fine. If you watch The Lion King, you remember the dung beetle there. But, um, so this is an African species, this big one. It's, it's a member of the scarab family. But we do have dung rollers here in the southwest, especially over in Arizona. Uh, they're just not as big as the African species. And so they'll take the dung of, of animals. They prefer elephant dung, but when that's not available, they'll settle for cattle. And um, they roll it up into a ball. They bury it into a shallow depression. They bury this ball of dung, and they lay an egg or two on it. And then the young uh, beetles have something to eat when they hatch. Because there's a lot of good food still in that dung that hasn't been digested. So scarab beetles. Here's another scarab beetle you might see at your porch light. It's called a ten-striped June beetle. Now, you may remember uh, growing up and hearing the term June bug. June bug is a general term. They're talking about June beetles, really, not bugs, but beetles. And June bug is a general term that can apply to any number of members of the scarab family that happen to be flying around. Um, this happens to be a 10-striped June bug or June beetle, the one of the common ones that we have here. 
harmless to you, but fun to see. There's a similar looking one. <clears throat> if any of you live over in the Smoke Tree Ranch area of Palm Springs, <clears throat> there's a similar looking beetle that's actually endangered. One of the few endangered insects we have in the Coachella Valley lives over near Smoke, Smoke Tree Ranch, and it's called the Casey's June Beetle. So watch for that. This is the common black beetle that people like to call stink bugs, okay? They're not bugs, they're beetles, so don't call them bugs. They've got a lot of nicknames though, circus beetle and darkling beetle, stink bug. Some people refer to them as Eliotis beetles after their genus, or they refer to them as Tenebrionid beetles because most of them belong to the family Tenebrionidae. So whichever term you like, I just, the only one I don't like is stink bug, because first of all, they're not bugs, they're beetles. And secondly, a lot of them don't stink. A few of them stink, it's true. And when they stick their abdomen up, sometimes they'll spray this noxious smelling stuff that deters predators from wanting to eat them. But a lot of the species just mimic the posture. They just get into the stink posture, and that's enough to scare away the predators because they think something bad is about to happen and it doesn't. So a lot of them are just tricking you. Um, and, but what the kangaroo rat does, they love to eat these guys, and most of these beetles come out at night when the K-rats do. They will stick the beetles into the ground, bottom, rear end first, so if they do stink, the stink goes into the ground, and then they bite off their heads. So as you're walking around the desert, you know, look closely, you'll find these decapitated beetles that are still stuck in the ground. And now you know what did that, that's the kangaroo rat. There's a lot of different species of these, so they're, they're but they're all black, very common. Here's another beetle. Uh, now, in a, in a good wildflower year, and I'm not sure this is going to be one. We were hopeful, but it's not looking good now. Um, but in a good wildflower year, you'll see a lot of these desert spider beetles crawling around, especially in desert hot springs and Thousand Palms area, where a lot of the wildflowers occur. And um, I used to think that they were yellow because of the pollen of the flowers. That's what somebody told me. So I kept repeating that. And it turns out it's not true. I did a little more investigating. And um, that yellow color that you see on the spider beetle is actually kind of a built-in sunscreen that they exude, and it helps protect them from the sun. And some individuals exude more of it than others. That's why some are all yellow, some are kind of half black, half yellow, and some don't have hardly any yellow at all. It's just an individual thing. Um, but they kind of look like spiders. They got that tiny little head and that big bulbous abdomen looking thing, kind of reminds you maybe of a black widow, that's why they're called spider beetles. Now some members of this family of spider beetles um, can cause blistering if you pick them up. It's called the blister beetle family, so beware, you know, you, this is one maybe you don't want to handle. What will happen is if you harass it, this chemical, which is called cantharidin, will start oozing out of the joints of their legs and onto your skin, and then you might react. So I don't mean to scare you, but um, be careful with that one. And here's another member of the blister beetle family. And when you see a bright warning coloration like this in nature, that critter is trying to tell you something. It's trying to say, back off, leave me alone, or you're in for a nasty surprise. Um, so that's nature's way of giving us fair warning. It's called aposomatic coloration. And so this is a great example of that. It's got this really bright, bright pattern. Beautiful beetle that you'll be lucky to see, but every now and then you might see one. Uh, but don't pick it up. Iron cross blister beetle. This is a member of the long-horned beetle family, and these are often called cockroaches for some reason, um, or date beetles, people like to call them date beetles, because maybe they see them over in the date grove areas. They're actually associated with Palo Verde trees. And there's a lot of those growing around town, maybe in your yard too. And one of the reasons that Palo Verde trees often will topple after some time 
is because the, the, the uh, root base rots out and a big windstorm comes and then just blows them over. And that's because for years, these giant grubs from this beetle have been munching, 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 munching at the roots and at the base of that tree. These grubs can live underground for years, maybe up to seven years, um, munching, 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 and then they finally turn into an adult and emerge and fly around for a few weeks. Um, so it's a harmless beetle. It's as big as a large cockroach, though, but it's got these long antennae. It's totally harmless to you, and they're not cockroaches. They're actually um, longhorn beetles. Speaking of cockroaches, though, you know this one the American cockroach, which is not from America, it's from Africa. Um, I, there's a nickname for this cockroach, they're, they're called Bombay Canaries. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought that was kind of funny. But they're from Africa, but of course they occur in Bombay and, and worldwide, and they're very common here in all the tropical areas too. They're all over the world now, uh, but they originated in Africa. And um, <clears throat> you've seen them around, I'm sure, very large. But did you know we have a native cockroach here that is not an import from Africa or Asia like the German cockroach or the American cockroach? This is a native cockroach. And again, if you live in some of the more sandy areas, especially out near the freeway, you might see these little whitish, kind of translucent, whitish, tannish, cockroaches. They're tiny. Um, they'll show up on your driveway. They come out of the sand and kind of end up on the edges of your house. But they're totally harmless and they're native to the area. And they blend right in with the sand that used to occur throughout the valley. So we call it a desert cockroach. Now these Jerusalem crickets, um, you know, I grew up in L.A., and, and we used to have a lot of these. We'd be digging in the ground, and we'd find these things. They're in moister areas. They don't like the desert. Uh, so it's actually a very uncommon thing here in the desert. You might have a few in Palm Springs that kind of spill over from Banning and Beaumont and Riverside area where they're a little more common, a little wetter over there. But for the most part, you're not going to see these in the desert. It's just too dry. And with climate change happening and the desert getting even warmer and drier than it already has been, we're going to see fewer and fewer of these Jerusalem crickets here in our region. They're kind of scary looking, but they're totally harmless. They're just crickets. Some years we have a lot of these um, mesquite bugs flying around. They're associated, of course, with mesquites. And this is one of those insects that you can call a bug. Okay, this is in the, what's called the true bug family, Hemiptera. So its name is really bug. Here's another true bug. This one's called the kissing bug because it likes to give you a nice little kiss right on the side of your lips where it's nice and soft. They come out at night. They look for that soft skin, and then they'll take a little blood meal from that. And then what happens is you wake up and you have a tendency to scratch the wound. And what you're going to, at the same time they're kissing you, they're defecating out the other end. And so when you wake up and scratch, you scratch the feces into the wound, and that's what gives you the kissing disease. So don't be alarmed. Um, first of all, kissing bugs are not that common here in the valley although we do have them, and our kissing bugs don't carry any kind of terrible disease like they might in the tropics. So you're okay. The worst that's going to happen is you might have kind of a painful sore that goes away after some time. Kissing bug. Now these guys like to occur in, in old sheds and piles of stuff that you haven't moved in ages, piles of clothes. In the tropics they live in thatched huts. A lot of people live in, in huts that have thatched roofs, and they live up there in the thatch and come down at night. Um, here I've noticed um, them in an old wood pile that I have. I've got an old wood pile on the side of the house I hadn't touched in years. And I finally got around to moving it or rearranging it or something, and out came, you know, dozens and dozens of these kissing bugs. So I know they like old wood piles for one. 
but I've never been bitten by one, and it's just not a common thing, so don't worry. Now, you remember that Schmidt pain index I was talking about? This guy is on the list, too. It's called the giant water bug. Um, it's another true bug that lives in the water and will come out of the water at night. It's attracted to lights. We, we have a smaller <clears throat> version of this here in the Coachella Valley, but you're not likely to encounter it unless you live near the Whitewater River Channel or somewhere where there's flowing water. Um, if you go wading in Whitewater River, in the Whitewater River, one of these could bite your toe. They have a nickname, Toe Biter. Um, if you've ever heard of a toe biter, it looks kind of like this. And so they can bite you if you're barefoot in the stream. A lot of dragonflies around, and they're good to have around because they eat mosquitoes. They're called mosquito hawks. And we also have damselflies. Damselflies <clears throat> are a little daintier. They hold their wings uh, folded over their body instead of out like a dragonfly's. And their eyes aren't as big as dragonflies, but they're in the same group. And they also eat mosquitoes, so they're good to have around. Another true bug, this one has leaf-like feet. And this is an interesting moth. You can see how big it is. It's a big noctuid moth. These moths are actually born in Mexico. So they're all from Mexico. And they cross the border. <clears throat> they fly right over the border checkpoint. And they'll end up at your porch light. So one night you might go out there and you'll see something dark. It looks like a big bat just sitting right next to your porch light. And it's probably a black witch moth, which is a neat thing. I only, I've only seen a few in my life. But, um, and they occur as far north as Canada. I think there's records for southern Canada. I know there's records for Michigan. And imagine these, these moths flying all the way from Mexico up to Michigan. But they just kind of wander north of the border very sporadically. So you never know when you might see one. The black witch. This is a super common moth. It's called the white line sphinx moth. If you're going to the tennis tournament in a couple weeks, and they got those big lights on like they always do at night, sometimes there's just swarms of these things buzzing around and buzzing into the courts and everything. Um, and when we have those years when all the caterpillars are crossing the roads, like Monterey Avenue and some of the streets like that, you know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> those caterpillars are from this moth. This is what all of those caterpillars are turning into. And the reason we see so many caterpillars in those years is because we've had rain, and the rain triggers the brown-eyed primrose, which is a common desert wildflower, to bloom on the sides of streets like Monterey Avenue and some of the vacant lots. And that's what these uh, moths love to feed on. They lay their eggs on there, and then the caterpillars start crawling all over the place. So white line sphinx moths, they're also called hummingbird moths. They fly during the day sometimes, and they actually look like hummingbirds. This one I liked. I just like the name of it, so I put it in there. It's a day-flying moth called a glorious squash vine borer. And it feeds on coyote melon. So if you know what coyote melon is, and it grows on some of the wash areas, even behind the library here, there might be some coyote melon growing wild. Um, between here and the wash, um, you'll find the glorious squash vine borer flying around. It's a day-flying moth with uh, translucent wings. This is a really um, interesting beetle that's associated with native California fan palms, like you'll find at Coachella Valley Preserve or the Indian Canyons, or in some of our yards if you planted the native kind. It only uh, occurs in the native California fan palms, the female lays her egg in the top of the palm. The larva, which are these big white grubs, kind of migrate down the center of the palm and live six or seven years inside the heart of the palm, just eating the inside of the palm. And then when it's time to metamorphosize and turn into an adult, they drill a hole out the side of the palm that looks like a big bullet hole. So if you've ever gone to the Coachella Valley Preserve hiking and seen some of those old palms there that are kind of stripped off, you'll see all these holes in them. It looks like somebody shot at them with a shotgun. Those are actually the exit holes of the giant palm boring beetle. And they always go out the whole rear end first. Because if they didn't, they would get stuck. 
So they have to chew out that hole until it's bigger than their rear end. They do a couple little tests, and then finally they crawl out rear end first. I've never seen it, but it's one of my dreams to see this one day, to see a palm boring beetle emerging, you know, to be there at that moment, you know. It's such a rare occurrence. It only happens for a couple days during the year. So call me up if, you, if you're witnessing this. I'll, I'll drop everything I'm doing and run right over, I promise. Uh, the yucca moth is a great story. Uh, it's associated with yucca trees, which includes the Joshua tree. So our Joshua trees depend on the yucca moth for its pollination. The female has special mouth parts. You can see them in the lower left. They're kind of rolled up like a party favor. And she crawls into the blossom of the Joshua tree, or the yucca. She rolls up a ball of pollen using those mouth parts called tentacles. She takes that pollen ball in her tentacles and flies to a completely different yucca plant. She knows the importance of cross-pollination. Well, really. So she flies to a completely different plant, flies into the female part of the flower now, unravels her tentacles, releases the pollen ball, pollinates the female part of the plant, and then she lays some eggs in that same chamber and she flies away. Now, what do you think her young are going to eat? The pollen that she's carefully gathered? No. They're going to eat the seeds that result from the successful germination of that, or the pollination of that plant. So she, she, she's, she has to ensure that the yucca trees are pollinated, otherwise her young starve. They can't eat pollen. They only eat the ripened seeds. So um, it, it's a really important relationship because she is dependent on those Joshua trees producing a new crop of seeds because that's what her young are going to feed on. Now, her young just eat a few of the seeds, you know, and thousands of them are produced. So there's plenty of seeds left over for the yucca to do its thing. So it's very happy to be pollinated in this way. So it's one of these relationships that's evolved over, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Yucca moths and the yucca plant, they're codependent on one another. Monarch butterflies, um, I've, I saw some today. So they're here. Some of them winter here in the valley. Some of them are already starting to pass through, migrating north. Now, our monarch butterflies are not part of that epic journey that you learned about in grade school, where they go from Mexico all the way to Canada. That flock of monarchs <clears throat> actually flies through Texas and central United States on its way up to Canada. So the ones that we have here on the West Coast are part of a different migration pattern, which is not as maybe dramatic as the one where they all go down to Mexico and they all go back up to Canada. Um, the Sunnylands Estate is an official monarch butterfly way station, so they do capture and release of monarchs there a couple times a year, and they put little tags on them, little stickers. They make sure to put one on each wing so they're not lopsided. And then they release them. So just like a banded bird, they're hoping some other monarch way station will catch them, and then they'll record the data and put it in the, in the data bank so we can figure out where our monarchs are going. Um, but those ones that go to Mexico are amazing. They fly all the way from Canada, one butterfly, to central Mexico, thousands of miles at the end of, at the end of summer. And they spend the winter down in Mexico in this one grove of trees. And then about this time of year, January, February, they start waking up and start making their journey north. And the first group of them is probably hitting the Texas border right about now. And they're going to lay eggs on milkweed, and then they're going to die. And then that next generation that's going to hatch there at the Texas border is going to fly the next leg of the journey. So maybe they make it to Missouri in a couple months from now. And the milkweed will be ripe by then, and they'll lay eggs on milkweed. And then they will die. And then the next generation will maybe take the leg from Missouri to the Canadian border. Lay eggs on milkweed. Now it's midsummer. They will die. And then that last generation that flies deeper into Canada to find milkweed further north, and now it's the end of summer, they'll lay their eggs and they'll die. And those ones that will hatch there, that special generation that's born in Canada, will be the ones that fly all the way back to Mexico. And they'll fly the first leg of next year's journey back to Texas. And in that tiny little monarch brain of theirs, they know how to do this. You know, their parents aren't there. They're dead. They don't have anybody to ask directions to this little grove of trees in Mexico. And they got to get themselves all the way from Canada 
and they find their way to this grove of trees. Pretty amazing. And they live for nine months or so, which is in the insect world is an amazingly long time, almost a year as an adult. There's a, a, a butterfly that resembles the monarch, and maybe you've heard this story, the viceroy. The monarchs taste really bad because they eat milkweed. The viceroys taste good, but they look like a monarch, so they kind of pass themselves off as a monarch, and predators tend to avoid them because they think they're going to be foul-tasting. They do not migrate. Yeah, they don't migrate, and they're not very common. Um, the most common butterfly around, and they're flying now, and they fly all year pretty much, is the painted lady. So in those years when we have massive numbers of butterflies hitting our, our cars on Interstate 10, remember those years? That's one of those outbreak years of the painted lady. And most of these painted ladies around here are born in Mexico, just like the black witch moth. And they fly across the border in mass, and they just disperse north by the millions. Uh, but it only happens every decade or so when the conditions are right. The rest of the time, we just have them around all the time in, in good-sized numbers. My favorite butterfly is a great purple hair streak. It feeds on mistletoe. So if there's mistletoe around where you live, you might see the great purple hair streak. And the, I think this is the last slide. This is the, um, did you know California had an official state insect? Well, you do now, and this is it. It's called the California dog face butterfly. And this is the official state insect of California. You know, we have a state flower, the poppy. We've got the, the state mammal, the grizzly bear that um, only exists on our flag now. We've got uh, the state bird. You know what that is. The California quail, right? So but this is our official state insect. And you'll notice the male, he's on the left, has a pattern in its upper wing that kind of looks like a dog. I used to look at that and say, you know, that doesn't look like a dog to me. It looks like a duck, <laughs> you know? But then, I, but then I looked at it again and I thought, you know what? It, it really, it looks like my neighbor's standard poodle after it comes back from the groomers. So now I'm back on the dog bandwagon. I'm, I'm good with dog face. Um, but you see it? You see the eye and the snout and the female has no pattern at all. So you'd never know she's a dog face. But they feed on mustard, which is a common roadside plant. Um, and there you go. Thank you.